All right, second half of part two. <clears throat> We're going to start with question 29. When an apple is dropped from a tower 256 feet high, we get H of T. Um, determine algebraically. So unlike the question earlier, now we have to show some work. We can't just type everything in our calculator. How long does it take to hit the ground? First thing we want to take note of, an object hits the ground when its height is zero. So I set H of T equal to zero. I solve. You don't need to factor this. You could, you could do quad formula if you want to go crazy. This is just simply using square roots. If you solve for T, move the 16 T, uh, negative 16 T squared over to the left, divide by 16. We get T squared equals 16. If we take the square root there, we get plus and minus four. Obviously negative four gets rejected. The object hits the ground after four seconds. So this is applying quadratic of function, applying quadratic functions, knowing how to solve using square roots. You could certainly do factoring or quad formula if you really like to. Um, and that's it for question 29, a pretty simple one. All right, this question was a little tricky as well. Key phrasing in question 30 was, see I have it underlined, exact value. This one's not going to work out nicely. And what a lot of people do sometimes, they kind of round it. You typed in your calculator and you're like, oh, okay, it's about this. And you just write that down. Exact value means we should leave it in whatever form it looks like. We're going to leave it in fraction form, I should say. So we start off solving by distributing. Whenever I have variables on both sides, I like to move them to one side. Notice I got a common denominator. Um, once I moved the two thirds over, I added it as well. And then I got, I wrote four as 12 thirds, which I can now combine with the two thirds. 12 thirds plus two thirds is 14 thirds. Uh, with my constant terms on the left, I got a common denominator of three. I got eight thirds. And you see a lot of slashes here, so let's explain what's going on. If I wanna get rid of the 14 thirds that's a coefficient of x right now, I'm gonna multiply by its reciprocal, specifically 3 fourteenths. When I multiply both sides by 3 fourteenths, my threes cancel out. Eight and 14, I can make four and seven. And that's ultimately my answer, because remember we wanted an exact value. Kind of just like when questions say that with radicals, uh, we don't wanna write as a decimal, same thing here, we don't wanna write the decimal equivalent of four sevenths. And that's question 30. Also take note, it says the words algebraically, meaning we can't do any fancy like y equals stuff, using systems or something, you know, creating two different functions here and using intersect. So we did have to show all this work for a two pointer. 31, classic rational, irrational. How many times have we seen this? In 31, once again, we see the number four sevenths coincidentally, uh, is the product multiplying of these two numbers, rational and irrational. So let's think about what happens. First of all, radical 16 is simply 4. 4 times 4 sevenths is 16 sevenths right away. It's rational, and this should always be our phrasing. It can be expressed as a fraction with integer, numerator, and denominator values. You can use a bunch of other phrasings. I find that the easiest. You can say, hey, these were both rational to begin with. Even though this looks, you know, maybe to someone that doesn't know perfect squares, it looks scary, but it's just four. So four is rational. Four sevenths is a fraction. It's rational. It's a non-terminating decimal, but it does repeat. If we multiply two rational numbers, they're always going to be irrational. Remember, there are kind of cases, hey, this times this is sometimes. This was the one that's always. If you're adding two rationals or multiplying them, they're always rational. So that's another route you can go. And last question in part two, question 32. Another kind of heavy two-pointer, actually graphing a piecewise as a two-point question. So with piecewise functions, um, I like to make mini tables. So for my mini tables here, um, I'm looking at my domain to tell me what x values I should use to graph. <clears throat> if you're curious, I do have my first value of a two. Why am I kind of skipping some? 
being that it's one half, I'm skipping odd numbers as to avoid any decimals or fractions. Now, once I plot this first function, being that this is less than, I usually make a little mark next to my table, but I didn't here. I'm going to have an open circle on this graph. And this is going to continue. Even though I stopped here, I can keep going anything less than 2. So this graph does have an arrow on the left-hand side. Now for the bottom function, very simple rule here of x. So whatever your input is, the output's going to be the exact same. So I chose 2, 3, 4 because it is greater than or equal to 2. And the outputs are 2, 3, 4. When we plot these, we have the exact opposite, a filled-in circle now because it was included. And there's an arrow on the right because, once again, it's greater than 2. This pattern is going to continue. Piecewise graphs, mini tables should be your best friends.